All right, guys. Well, it is another cool and cloudy, soon to be rainy. It is, where are we? It is Tuesday, August 29th, 2023, and your old Doomer real estate investor <coughs> on the Gulf Coast of Florida uh, is taking a break in his summer-long forest forest bath, you know. That's pretty much what I do with my life, is I forest bathe, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But uh, right now, I, I'm enjoying the irony of being a Doomer real estate investor who, uh, you know, bought this acre of land in Inglis, Florida, that's I-N-G-L-I-S. I'm actually north of Inglis, Florida, pretty much in the direct hit zone of uh, this latest little hiccup going on in the Gulf of Mexico, trying to appreciate the humor of my decision uh, <laughs> to buy an acre of real estate investment property in Inglis, Florida, in the year, uh, when did I buy that, in 2022, 21 or 20, I can't even remember, uh, so anyway, of course, I am watching with a, a mounting sense of dread, the oncoming, uh, the oncoming hurricane, but we're going to take a break in our hurricane coverage, several of my alert uh, listeners here at Collapse Chronicles have sent me a link to this long article uh, in the good old Guardian, which I'm not going to, I, I'm just going to touch base on it. <coughs> You've probably seen it. I'll put the link to you on here for you, titled, Off the Charts Records. Has humanity finally broken the climate? Extreme weather is smacking us in the face with worse to come, but, but a tiny window of uh, a tiny window of a uh, tiny window of a uh, of a uh, of a of a of a of a of a of, 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 of hope remains, say, leading climate scientist. So, uh, I'm just going to read the opening of this. I'm not going to read the comments from the 45 leading climate scientists. This is the lead up to it. The record-shattering heat waves, wildfires, and floods destroying lives in the U.S., Europe, India, China, and beyond in 2023 have raised an alarming question. Have humanity's relentless carbon emissions finally pushed the climate crisis into a new and accelerating phase of destruction the issue is being strongly debated with accusations of doom-mongering. Ah, uh, I can't imagine who's accusing people of doom-mongering being countered with charges of complacency. The answer matters. How bad is it? And how can we limit the damage to find out the Guardian asked 45, 45 leading climate scientists from around the world. We also asked the equally vital question of whether extreme weather events were hitting people faster and harder than expected. The scientists told us that Despite it certainly feeling as if events had taken a frightening turn, 
the global heating seen to date was entirely in line with three decades of scientific predictions. Being proved right was cold comfort, they said, as their warnings have so far large, been largely in vain. Increasingly severe weather impacts had also been long signposted by scientists, although the speed and intensity of the reality scared some, the off-the-charts sea temperatures in Antarctica sea ice loss were seen as the most shocking. Yes, but the scientists were clear. The scientists were clear the world has not yet passed a tipping point huh, into runaway climate change, but some warned that it got ever closer with continued heating. <clears throat> yes, the scientists also warned that the crazy extreme weather of recent months was just the tip of the iceberg compared with the even worse impacts to come. In just a decade, the exceptional events of 2023 could be a normal year, mm, unless there is a dramatic increase in climate action. Climate action, that's, this is the one I I love when they talk about climate action and then just go on to the next sentence. Some further warn that the tendency of climate models to underestimate extreme weather meant we were flying partially blind into a future that could be even more catastrophic than anticipated. However, however, a tiny window, a tiny window of opportunity remained opened to tackle the climate crisis, they said, with humanity having all the tools needed. The researchers overwhelmingly pointed to one action as critical, keeping your pecker in your pants and not letting your knickers down. Well, obviously, uh, not breeding is nowhere mentioned in this article. Overpopulation, nowhere mentioned in this article. Overshoot, which is the cause of climate change. Nowhere mentioned in this article. No, the researchers overwhelmingly pointed to one action as critical, slashing the burning of fossil fuels down to zero. And of course, uh, I guess none of the climatologists advocating just stopping oil uh, pointed out that if we do slash the use of fossil fuels down to zero, that's, uh, you know, global industrial civilization will collapse probably in about six weeks. Half the population of the planet will be dead of starvation within about six months. And then, uh, so I guess at that point, you will start seeing some uh, reduction. So yeah, you know, the more I think about it, I agree with these scientists that, that slashing fossil fuel use down to zero is the best course of action uh, to prevent climate change and, and, and every other environmental disaster because getting rid of the major cause of overshoot, which of course would flip the hockey stick in the other direction, 
and kill off at least half the planet within six months would do more than anything else to solve climate change. So I guess I'm getting on board with these, these Just Stop Oil people. But of course I know you guys, so then so they go into these interviewing these 45 people, but I know who you want to hear from. That is, of course, Doom Slayer, Doom, Doomer Slayer Michael Mann. Quote, there is no reason to invent an acceleration that is not there to make the case for urgency. Uh, and let's see, I know. Okay. <clears throat> Man said, quote, there is a misconception that these extreme weather events constitute some sort of tipping point that we've crossed. They don't. You heard it first. There is no reason to invent an acceleration. Uh, we have crossed. There is no evidence, according to Michael Mann, that these extreme weather events constitute some sort of tipping point. They don't. And then, of course, they go into the hopium of that tiny, tiny window of opportunity that is still open to humanity. Yes, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> since I'm sitting here, uh, obviously thinking uh, while I'm forest bathing about uh, what's going to my property, my real estate investment property is going to look like, oh, about 15 hours from now, uh, I could not help uh, enjoying this article from the New Republic. Stop calling it climate anxiety. It's climate dread. Climate dread. So I had to look up the definition of dread just to make sure we were all on the same page. This is from dictionary.com. Dread. Great fear or apprehension. The thought of returning to New Jersey filled her with dread. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, if I thought that uh, I was going to uh, be returning to New Jersey, uh, I would be doing everything I could to be throwing myself directly into the path of Hurricane Idalia. Uh, so what is my biggest dread? You know, my, my biggest dread, since I, I don't have a house on this property, is uh, are these, um, <clears throat> you know, a year and a half ago, I, I have these five big-ass pine trees on my property, and after seeing uh, what Hurricane Michael did to the piney woods uh, outside of Panama City, Florida in 2018. I said if I ever buy a piece of real estate in, in coastal Florida, the first thing I'm going to do is take out all the big pine trees. So what I did in, in April of yeah 2021, I girdled I didn't cut them down because they were still alive. I, I girdled these five big-ass uh, pine trees. Uh, and then my plan was to go cut them down, give them six months to die, 
and then go cut them down last November. But that did not happen, so now they've been dead for a year and a half. So now I have five giant dead pine trees uh, on, my, on my coastal Florida real estate investment property. Uh, but I guess the, the bright side of it all is that I don't have to pay anybody to actually cut down these five pine trees because Hurricane Idalia is going to save me hundreds of dollars in uh, arborist fees. In about 15 seconds, uh, I'm going to save hundreds of dollars thanks to Hurricane Idalia. My biggest fear is now uh, giving myself a hernia when I return down there. I'm heading back down there in November and giving myself a hernia. So that's my biggest source of dread. <clears throat> so all eyes on Inglis, Florida. All right, but back to the article. Now that we all know what dread is, <coughs> stop calling it climate anxiety. It's climate dread the immensity and destruction of the 2018 wildfires in Sonoma County, California, left a visceral impression on Mark Freed. He was 54, and he had recently moved to the area with his then, with his then wife, yes, to escape the crowded city of San Francisco, but never lived, but he'd never lived through a wildfire season before, the walls of flame, quote, make you feel like an ant. You don't feel human. You're just a thing to burn. In 2018 alone, California saw 7,948 wildfires destroy <clears throat> almost 2 million acres. Yes, for the next few years, as Freed saw fire after fire. He felt a growing sense of helplessness and foreboding. He would wake up and immediately feel the heaviness set in, filling the quiet, you know, created by his then wife moving out on him. In his panic, he researched places that seemed the most protected from climate change such as the Finger Lakes of New York, where fire and extreme heat would not touch him again for at least some years. But despite continually preparing for the worst to the best of his abilities, moving somewhere he thought would be safer, stocking up supplies, reinforcing his house, he still could not shake the feeling that disaster is inevitable. Quote, It's like there's no control over what's going to happen to us. But I thought there was a tiny window of opportunity, Michael, or Mark, whatever the hell your name is. Apparently, Mark has not heard of the tiny window of opportunity. Anyway, it's like there's no control over what's going to happen to us, he told me. And trying to name his emotions, Freed said what he was experiencing wasn't quite anxiety. It was deeper and heavier than that. That looming feeling. That looming feeling. He said was dread. <coughs> when burdened <coughs> by the tangible angst and unease around the future of our planet, a term like climate anxiety can seem insufficient. Mm. It can feel paltry and shallow, implying we are fretting or fussing over an imagined future of a few pine trees 
blowing over in your yard. In reality, seeing the mounting global disasters and learning of evidence-based projections of our changing world comes with a heavy emotional gravity. For some, anxiety simply does not do it justice. For people like Freed and myself and potentially you waiting for a hurricane to smash your real estate investment, the phrase climate dread, better than climate anxiety, legitimizes the real and tangible threat coming toward us and communicates that fear to others. The importance of this distinction is not just etymological. The emotion of dread affects us differently from anxiety. Understanding how can provide insight into our reactions to climate change and why it can be so hard to spur people to, here we go again, climate action. Climate action. <clears throat> Defining dread is a tricky task. No, it's not. We went over there to dictionary.com. We defined it, you know, talking about how you would feel if you were moving to New Jersey. Okay, just imagine the, the, the absolute existential horror you would feel if you had to move to New Jersey. All right, we can all agree on this. It's not, it's not that tricky. Any two people might define or feel various emotions, including dread, differently. But Andreas Olsen distinguishes dread as being heavier and, well, obviously, if it's heavier, more concrete than anxiety. Olsen, a professor of psychology at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, told me that anxiety doesn't always have a tangible or definite cause, while dread is more targeted. You might feel anxious before a large party, for example, but you might dread that party if no, if you know Michael Mann may be attending. You might feel anxious about the state of climate change, but you might dread the oncoming hurricane slamming into your real estate investment the coming day or the next hurricane season or the consequences of us failing to meet our carbon emission goals by 2050. Yes, dread is unique because we feel it when we know or at least strongly suspect that, quote, something bad is coming and we cannot stop it, hmm. said Kate Sweeney, a social psychologist at, the, at UC Riverside, the anticipation the waiting and feeling of inevitability are what make dread so unbearable. Yes. In my conversations with Freed, where he called climate change a credible threat, he seemed to feel the heaviness of the coming decades also. Quote, we're probably all going to die horrible deaths, close quote, thanks to climate change, he told me. Waiting with dread is particularly unpleasant when you don't know 
when the proverbial shoe, if you're wearing shoes, will drop. Yes. Uh, then they talk about some of those studies. None of us can choose to pull dreaded climate events forward and into the present just to eliminate the waiting. Although buying real estate investment property on the coast of Florida is as good a way as any. And a consequence of constantly seeing those inevitable and immovable disasters and knowing that more and worse catastrophes are coming can be a feeling of overwhelming doom and helplessness, said Barbara Easterlin, co-president of the Climate Psychology Alliance of North America. Quote, you get this sense of not being able to act or move forward, she said. Uh, but they keep talking about climate action. Hmm. When dread, when dread freezes us like that, it creates emotional effects akin to depression tamping down on our energy and making it hard to take action. Yes. Thinking about the enormity of climate change feels bad. A common instinct is to just avoid those thoughts entirely. Hmm. Unfortunately, that avoidance creates a feedback loop, not a tipping point, a feedback loop where the issue becomes only more distressing. Where your brain learns and relearns that this subject is terrible and must be avoided at all cost. Yes. As Britt Ray, a researcher on climate and mental health at Stanford University, writes in her book about climate anxiety, titled Generation Dread, quote, most of us don't deeply engage with this reality, not because we don't care, but because it is painful. We're just so deeply caught in the double bind that we become immobilized. Are you immobilized, Sancho Banza? It is a slippery slope from helplessness to resignation and acceptance and mass resignation and acceptance are not strategies that will steer the world off its current disastrous trajectory. Yes, but how can you, how can you stop feeling dread when you also feel like our world is doomed? Yes. Perhaps the better question to ask is, how can we transform dread into something more workable, said Easterlin. You will hear this over and over again. Action. Action is one of the antidotes to dread. Close quote. Research seems to support this. Uh, a study published just this month found that among teenagers and young adults experience cl experiencing climate distress, those who reported making even small life changes or decisions for climate reasons, like reducing their single-use plastic consumption. All right! Opting to commute via bicycle instead of car or participating in political activism 
still experienced anger and frustration, but were also more likely <coughs> to feel positive emotions like who? Oh. Positive emotions like who? Oh. Positive emotions like who? Oh. Like who? Oh. Like who? Oh. Like who? Oh. Like <coughs> hope. Those who made fewer of those choices, by contrast, were more likely to experience guilt, shame, sadness, and fear without the hopeful counterbalance. Yes. Participating in even small actions. Hmm and thinking about where and how you can be effective can move dread into something positive and her and her and her and her and her hopeful said Easterlin. It can pull you out of that forward looking dread and into the current moment where you can see yourself acting capably and with impact. Yes, it takes you out of the role of a passive victim and into a position of agency and strength. Yes. While it is overwhelmingly seen as a negative emotion, negative emotion, there are some positive side effects of experiencing dread, experts say. Like many emotions, dread is contagious. Yes. Whether we express it in person or online, dread catches and amplifies, which can paradoxically help bring more attention and awareness to the issue at hand and possibly bring like-minded people about how fucked we truly are together. Yes, this helps us all establish what we communally think is undesirable or should be avoided, otherwise known as hopium, thinking that there is a tiny window of opportunity left. Yes. When everyone is in agreement to feel dread over something like climate change, we can collectively establish a target to work against. Oh, uh, anyway, I did not realize that this uh, went on to, uh, anyway, I guess we're fine. Are we getting to the end of this? I'm, I'm, I'm dreading uh, having to keep sitting here. <clears throat> when it comes to dealing with your own individual and internal sense of dread about a major hurricane slamming into your real estate investment in coastal Florida, climate-aware experts told me that a number of things can't help. The first step is to always acknowledge that climate dread is a feeling that is warranted. We are living through an unprecedented ecological breakdown of our own making. There you go. And it's natural to feel strong emotions. The second is to realize that dread, like humanity itself, is not sustainable and constantly focusing on how fucked we are can cause you to ignore elements of your life that are meaningful. Some therapists have found that patients respond well to methods like cognitive behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and forest bathing. Forest bathing, huh? A process where patients spend time in a forest immersed in its atmosphere to reconnect with nature. Of course, I, uh, I spend more time forest bathing 
every day of my life than 99% of clueless morons spend in uh, forest bathing uh, in their entire lives. Now, I'm not sure you would want to be forest bathing uh, on my real estate investment property in Inglis, Florida tonight. Not the best forest bathing forecast. Mark Freed began talking to a therapist about his dread in 2020. They validated his emotions and helped Freed confront the real consequences of wildfires he experienced, as well as how he imagines fires worsening in the future. He tried forest bathing. Yes, probably, I'm guessing, for about five minutes. But then he probably started worrying that the forest he was bathing in was getting ready to erupt into flame any minute. And while he has pa paused his forest bathing therapy, Freed says his unease is now manageable. He has his routines. He plays with his dog. He plays with his dog. He devotes time and energy to the things he cares about, and that's what makes life livable. I asked him if his dread still bothered him. It is less uneasy, he told me. It's not gone, gone. Maybe it will go away. Maybe one day when we have a better world. <laughs> oh, God. And so, of course, uh, we have to hear from this fellow Humpty Dumpty weighing in on this article. Humpty Dumpty, look on the bright side, guys. It will be much easier to find hot water for your forest bath than it used to be. Yes. Anyway, <coughs> I got to wrap this up and uh, I got to run up to my forest bathtub and uh, grab some of my shit uh, out of there to flee the next monsoon getting ready to slam into Bugs in a Jar Farm tonight as we gear up for the biggest weekend of the year as the forest bathers invade. Yes, yeah, so are you ready to go do some more forest bathing? You dreadful little dog. Get out there and forest bathe while you still can. Bye guys. <laughs>